I want to speak about something in the lines of uh, being born of the light and being sons of light. Just want to adjust this thing a little bit. Okay. So let's start in just to lay a foundation of a few things. Let's start in John chapter 1. Always a good place to just get some point of reference. Right, so this is God's holy word. This is it's anointed by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of old spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will move upon us today and we will hear and we will receive the word in our hearts and bear good fruit in Jesus' name. All right. Are you ready? Okay. Glasses. Okay. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself. He was present originally with God. All things were made and came into existence through Him, and without Him was not even one thing made that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so just a few points. The Word was God. So it's just to get a few points of reference. When you think of the Word, the Word is not information. The Word is God. The Word is the Holy Spirit Himself speaking. Uh, we need to remember that uh, the Father is Spirit. Okay, I'm not going to go into that rabbit hole too, too far. But God is Spirit. In the beginning, the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep, and God said. So that's the creation word. God spoke. The Spirit speaking is the word. And when the Spirit spoke, it was written down by scribes, by people who listened uh, to someone speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it was written down. There's some prophets that wrote it down themselves, but most of them spoke, and it was written down by someone else. Okay? I think Jeremiah was writing down himself. So, but the point is, the Word is God Himself. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaks to the Jews and he says, You are the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Okay, no one puts, uh, lights a lamp and puts it under a peck measure or a bushel, but it when you light the lamp, you put it on a lampstand so that everyone can see in the house. So when your light is, is shining, you are a light. You're giving off light. Okay? So when um, Paul the Apostle saw the visions in the book of Revelation, he, he had to give warnings to the churches. God gave them warnings, unless I come and take away the light from the lampstand. Okay. So there's a light and... The light shines, the light that is shining is the spirit and the word that is dwelling on the inside of us. Now, if you look in the, um, the letters in Revelation, uh, it was speaking more specifically about people who were not really doing the thing that they were called to do. They were not shining, so it was more specifically Speaking of a person that was in a position that would be taken away. Okay, just to clear that up. So God is not, uh, is not one that would give a gift and then take it away. Okay, just to, to settle that. So he says, he came to that which belonged to him, verse 11, to his own, his domain, his creation, his things, his will. And they who were his own did not receive him and did not welcome him. So he, the 
light, the word, came to his own. They who were his own did not receive him, did not welcome him. Okay, so uh, Jesus also says in John chapter 9, he says it, I am the light of the world. Again. This Bible has more pages than the other one. It's four translations. Okay. He says, As long as I am in the world, verse 5, I am the world's light. Verse 5, As long as I am in the world, King James, I am the light of the world. So Jesus the word, the light, came unto his own, his own received him not. The light of the world. Okay. So he says, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, the word, the light, he gave the authority to become children of God, King James, sons of God, that is to those who believe in, adhere, trust, rely on his name who owe their birth neither to bloods nor to the will of the flesh nor to the will of man, that of natural father, but to God, they are born of God. That means they must be born of the light. That means they must be born of the word. Okay. So as many as received him, the light, the word, gave he power to become sons of God as many as believed on his name. His name in this chapter is defined as the Word. Okay, even in Revelation, he's called the Word. All right. So, verse 16 says, Out of his fullness we have all received one grace after another, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, even favor upon favor and gift heaped upon gift. Okay, so just quickly jump to John chapter 3. He says in verse 33, whoever receives his testimony has set his seal of approval, of approval to this God is true. That man is definitely certified, acknowledged, Declared once and for all, and is himself assured that it is divine truth that God cannot lie. Okay, amplify, there's a lot of extra words. For since he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, so it's now again the one that came, who is the word, who is the light. He proclaims God's own message. God does not give him his spirit sparingly or by measure, but boundless is the gift of God, the gift God makes of his spirit. King James, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. Okay. We're going to get to a point soon. John chapter 4, verse 10 says, Jesus answered it. Remember the woman at the well now Jesus is speaking to the woman. He says, give me a drink. She said, you have no bucket. How can, how can I give you a drink? So Jesus says, verse 10, if you had only known and had recognized God's gift and who this is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him instead and he would have given you living water. So the Spirit is a gift, a boundless gift. He says, the one whom he has sent speaks his word. And to him who speaks his word, boundless is the gift God makes of his spirit. Okay? So if we speak the word. Because what, what happens is, the word, the, the spirit spoke, it was written down, it's now in text form. Now if we read it and we speak it and we believe it, it is the power of the Spirit is released again. So 
it is like it's caught up and recorded and stored. And you can tap into it anytime you want. The same creation power, the same spirit, the same God that made everything, that is the light, that is the life, that is the word. When you read this, you know, if God just took his thoughts and pressed print, you get this. Okay? So now you you got, you know, and, and all explains everything. Don't read anything in isolation. Let the scriptures declare the scriptures. Okay. Let the Spirit speak. So now, now you take what is revealed by the Spirit and you take it on your lips and you start speaking. What will happen is there will be a manifestation of the Spirit of God around you. And the more you speak and believe this word, to the, to the bounds of the, or the boundlessness that you speak and believe the word, the Spirit of God will be boundlessly active in your life. Okay. So there's a gift. The gift is the word, the life, the light, him that came down, the person. That's the gift. The gift is given to us in text form. When you believe in his name, when you believe in him, he gives you the power to become born of the same life, the same light, the same word, the same spirit out of which he exists. When you become one with this word, that word finds entrance into your heart, you are born again, born like we read in, in John chapter 1, not of the flesh. You owe your birth not to bloods. You owe your birth not to the will of man or to the will of the natural father. But you are born of God. You owe your birth to him. Born from above. Born from the spirit. Born from the word. Born from light. Okay, so we're going to just look at a few scriptures concerning to be born from God and to be born out of light. Okay? All right. So the gift of God, yes, you get the gifts of the Spirit. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14 and other scriptures, whereby you can f flow in certain spiritual gifts, wonderful. We want that. And the Word says, desire it, especially that you may prophesy. So, yes. Then there's gifts, people that God sent, Ephesians chapter 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So if they are speaking the word of God to a certain measure, that spirit will flow through them. Okay? So if they receive the gift, they will drink of the living waters. Living waters will flow from out of them. If you take John 4 and John 7, 37 together, they become a river of living water. So they kind of become like a gift to people because the gift they received starts flowing out and blesses people. Okay? All right. So, but the gift is Jesus Christ. The gift is the Word or the Spirit or the light of God that became flesh and we saw his glory. The word became flesh and we beheld his glory, glorious of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, if we are begotten of the same spirit, of the same word, then he is not the only begotten anymore, but the firstborn of many brethren, if you read Colossians. So, Jesus is your older brother. Okay? Okay? But also, he shall be called Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. So he is also called Everlasting Father. If you look to Jesus, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. Because he only does what he sees the Father doing. Okay? So, one. There's no distinction. When Jesus is there, the Father is there. When Jesus speaks, the Father speaks. If Jesus is present, the Father is present. 
and he gives you that same spirit. He reveals the Father to you, and you can know the Father if you know Jesus, who is the gift. Okay, so Jesus said, let's quickly jump to John chapter 12. Start at the back and work to the front. Or something. <laughs> <We'll see. laughs> he says, verse 49. Verse 48. Anyone who rejects me persistently sets me at naught, refusing to accept my teachings. Okay, remember John 1. He came unto his own. I think it's around about verse 11, verse 12. He came unto his own. His own received him not. Okay, whoever rejects me persistently, sets me at naught, refusing to accept my teachings, has his judge for the very message that I've spoken itself will judge and convict him at the last day. This is because I have never spoken on my own authority or my own accord as self-appointed, but the Father who sent me has himself given me orders what to say and what to tell. I do not, uh, and, and I know that his uh, commandment is eternal life. So whatever I speak, I am saying exactly what my father has told me to say in accordance with his instructions. The commandment that he heard from the father is eternal life. He doesn't command you to live forever. That's not the commandment. He says the words, the precepts, the doctrines, the whatever comes out of the mouth of Jesus which represents and shows the Father, that is the eternal life. So if you hear that, you receive eternal life. If you are born of that word, you are born of life. So in him was the word. Uh, the word. In him was the life and the life was the light. So he is the word, he is the life, he is the light, that is the gift. Okay? He only says what the Father says. He only does what the Father does. Okay. Now just rewind a little bit to verse 35. Jesus said to them, You will have the light only a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Keep on living by it so that the darkness may not overtake and overcome you. He who walks about in the dark does not know where he's going. He's drifting. Okay. So if you walk in the dark, it simply means that you can't see. So the Word and the Spirit causes you to see. Causes your heart, your conscience to be illuminated. You know where you are going. You can see things in the Spirit. You can see what the Father shows you. You can see what Jesus shows you. You can see what the Spirit shows you. Okay? You start operating by gifts. Specifically, you know, you can, the, the seeing thing specifically operates in the prophetic gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and prophecy. But you start seeing something. You get some impression. You get dreams. You get visions. Okay? Joel chapter 2. Uh, I will, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and the old men will see visions, the young men will dream dreams, or other way around, okay? And, you know, I'll pour out my spirit on men servants and maid servants, and they will, you know, prophesy and speak in new languages and all kinds of things. Okay, so it's supposed to be young and old, male, female, rich and poor, doesn't matter who, if you have the spirit, you have everything. Okay. Boundless is the gift that God makes of His Spirit. Okay. While you have the light, believe in the light. Have faith in it. Hold to it. Rely on it. That you may become sons of the light and be filled with light. Okay. Jesus said these things, and then he went away and hid himself from them, was lost to their view. Okay. So God wants us 
to abide by the word, speak the word, be, you know, believe the word, and be born of the word, and that gives, he gives us the power to become sons of God. The word is the spirit. The word is the light. And the word is life. So your relationship with the word will make you a son of God, a son of the spirit, a son of light, a son of life. Okay? So you will manifest what you see here, what you believe, and what you speak. It's so important. So, uh, let's just jump to Romans chapter 5. Well, we're still kind of talking about the gift part. Okay, so... Verse 15, I think, is a good place to start. It says, But God's free gift is not at all to be compared to the trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if many died through one man's falling away, speaking of Adam, his lapse, his offense, much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor of one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. Okay, so God's grace and his gift comes through favor or uh, grace from Jesus, through Jesus to many. Okay. Okay. Simply means this. He came. He is the gift, the word, the spirit, the light, the life. He came and he said, the good shepherd lays down his life. No one takes it away. They crucified him. Like a lamb before a shearer is his thumb, so he opened not his mouth. Just let it happen. He, he sacrificed his life. The if you read First Peter, the blameless for the guilty, the, the innocent for the guilty, um, so that we can be made righteous, so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be made alive in him. Okay, so now he says, verse 17, if because of one man's trespass, that's Adam, Death reigned through that one. So death reigned because Adam brought death into the world. You can read it in verse 12. Sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death reigned because Adam was disobedient. He did not speak God's word. He spoke the word of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He did not believe God's word. He disbelieved God's word and he spoke other words, a different source, the words of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the result was not the gift, the life, the light. The result was darkness and death and sin and shame. Okay? If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness putting them into right, standing with himself, reign as kings in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Okay, so maybe there's some things in life that you need to reign over. Okay, have you ever had some kind of obstacle in your life? Okay, have you ever had something go wrong in any way in your life? Okay, am I speaking to someone? Am I eating? <laughs> okay, all right. Is there some things that's persistent that doesn't want to go? Okay, listen. You have the power of the kingdom of God on the inside of you. 
The power on, of the kingdom of God comes to you through faith in the word of righteousness, which is life, which is light, which is spirit, which is word. That is God's gift. Okay, so those who receive him, he came unto his own, own received him, not but to as many as received him, gave ye power to become sons of God. So you first receive him. Those who receive the free gift, those who receive the overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness. Overflowing grace means someone else paid your sin. You don't pay for your sin. Someone else mopped up your mess. You don't mop up your mess. You turn now entirely your complete focus and attention and affection on him. And you only do what he says, and you only say what he says. That's receiving the gift, which is the word. Receiving the gift, you can't say you receive the gift if you don't believe the word. You can't say you receive the gift if you don't do the word. So receiving the gift that causes you to be born again means you hear the word, you believe the word, you speak the word, you do the word. That means you receive the abundance, overflowing grace and the free gift, Christ. The gift of righteousness. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. Well, let's start in verse 17. He says, If any man be, where? In heaven? No. In, I don't know, in university? No. In, in a nice car? No. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not if any man does good things, if any man is wonderful, it's good to be wonderful. So be wonderful, that's great. But he says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. There's this doctrine going around that says that everyone is now the new creation since the cross. Well, then the new creation... Then the new creation is less desirable. If what we see is the new creation, then I'm sorry, Jesus didn't pay a fantastic price. If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. The old have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. So that means you have to be intent. You have to be specific about it. What are you looking at? You need to look. Behold, it's made new. Behold, Christ, the gift. And then he says, he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, etc. But it says in verse, tw verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? Amplified a bit more words. Our sake he made Christ to be sin, in you know sin. Sin and through him we might become endued with, viewed as being in examples of the righteousness of God, what we ought to be approved to say. Well, okay, let me just read the King James to you. Because that kind of clouds the argument. This thick Bible, it's got too many pages. Okay, Second Corinthians 5. He hath made him to be sin for us, 
who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. New American Standard. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So you are the righteousness of God if you are in him. The new creation is in Christ. The new creation is in Him. For you to be in Him, He needs to be in you. So, you need to receive Him, the gift, the word, the life, the light, into your heart. Jesus says to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, He says, uh, you are of your father the devil. <laughs> you do the lusts of your father. He says, different verses that I put together, my words have no entrance in you. Okay, so his words to receive him, his word must have entrance in our hearts. So we need to behold we need to look to the Word, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, as in a mirror. And you need to behold the face of Christ as you read the Word. You see Him revealed to you. You look to Him. You see who He is that is now on the inside of you. You get to know the one who is inside of you. You get to associate with Him and realize, I am now inside of Him. I find my new life in Him. My righteousness is Him. I live in Him. I dwell in Him when I dwell in the Word. Yes, the Word dwells in me. Yes, I dwell in the Word. I meditate on the Word day and night. Joshua 1 verse 8. Meditate. Don't let this book depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so you shall make your way prosperous. So we need the Word. We need to be born of the Word. We need to meditate the Word. And we need to speak the Word. Okay. All right, so... James chapter 1. All right, so that was just the introduction. All I want to do is just read James chapter 1. Oh, wait, no, there's something else I still want to read. First John chapter 1. Are you still with me? First John 1. We are writing about the word of life in him who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen with our own eyes, whom we have gazed upon for ourselves and have touched with our hands. And the life and aspect of his being was revealed and made manifest, and we saw as eyewitnesses and are testifying to declare to you the life, eternal life. You see the word? He says, the command of my Father is eternal life. Okay? Uh, Jesus also said it in John chapter 17. He says, to know, to know, this is eternal life, to know him and to know Jesus Christ whom we have sent, the gift that he has sent. Okay. The life was revealed, okay? Eternal life from him who existed from the beginning, in him who existed from the beginning. Where am I? Who already existed with a father who actually was made visible to us, his followers. Okay, so that if you can just take that to John chapter 1, he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw him. We saw his glory, full of grace and truth. Okay, what we have seen and ourselves heard, we are also telling you so that you too may realize and enjoy fellowship as partners and partakers with us. This fellowship that we have, 
which is a distinguishing mark of Christians, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So, because of the Word, because of what have been told us, the preaching, we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Verse 4, And we now are now writing these things to you so that our joy, you include it, brackets, may be full and your joy may be complete. And this is the message of promise, which we have heard from him and now reporting to you. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. No, not in any way. Right. Now he says, so if we are partakers and enjoy fellowship with him, if we say we are partakers and enjoy fellowship with him, when we live and move and walk about in darkness, we are both speaking falsely and do not live and practice the truth. So, which means, when we get the word, when we get the light and the life, we need to actually do it. We need to, to arrange our lives to it. We need to reorganize our lives to fit the word. We don't bend the word to fit our lives. We need to reorganize our lives to fit in with the word. Okay. But if we really are living and walking in the light as he himself is in the light, so if we just take everything that we've read until now, you walk in the, in the word. You have fellowship with the word. You are obedient to the word. You meditate the word. You speak the word. He says, if we really are living and walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have true unbroken fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from sin and guilt, keeps us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. So in fellowship with the word, your conscience is continuously cleansed. Okay? So the more you hear the word of the gospel, the clearer your conscience will be. The more light and life will be in your conscience. And the more your conscience will allow you only to do and say what God says. Okay? So the, it's Ephesians chapter 5 says, speaks about it's the washing of the water by the word. So every time you hear the word, there's a washing of the conscience. Because there's a fellowship with the word of righteousness. And the word of righteousness speaks of his blood for your sins. Cleansing you. Bringing forgiveness to you. Bringing life to you. Bringing absolution to you. Re removing all shame. Removing all guilt. That's the fellowship that your heart need to have. Your heart should not have fellowship with shame and guilt always being, you know, remembering the past and where you missed it and what you said wrong. And somewhere you need to let yourself now move forward. Somewhere you need to let the past be in the past and realize I'm now in Christ. I'm a new creation. The old is past, the new is come. I need, now need to behold. I now need to set my eyes on Jesus. I now need to set my eyes on what the Word says I am. So somewhere you need to allow yourself to assume the new identity that you've re received freely by grace in Christ. Somewhere you need to update what you believe about yourself to agree with what God believes about you after the cross. So what does God believe about you? That your sins are atoned for. That you are washed clean. That you are holy that you are blameless, that you are spotless in Christ. Okay? You need to have fellowship with that in your heart, in your conscience. All right. So he says, If we say we have no sin, we delude and lead ourselves astray, and the truth which the gospel presents is not in us. So I don't try to justify what I'm doing, bend the word to fit what I'm doing, I can come to God and say, Lord, what I'm doing is not the word. Help me get out of it. Thank you for your blood. Wash me clean. And there's something else that he has for me. Okay. Verse 9. If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, dismiss our lawlessness and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's a continuous cleansing in fellowship. So we need to have continuous fellowship. 
then our hearts will continuously feel clean. From God's perspective, you're forgiven. From God's perspective, you're holy. From God's perspective, you're righteous. But somewhere this needs to translate into your life, into your reality. And that happens when the word of the gospel comes. Okay. So the word is the gift. The righteousness is the gift. The spirit is the gift. So Romans chapter 10 says, the word of righteousness, the word of faith says, do not say, <laughs> who shall ascend into heaven? That's to bring Christ down. Do not say, who shall go into the abyss? That's to bring Christ from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your heart, on your lips, the word of faith which we preach. Okay. So, your speech need to be free from different agendas of how you can justify yourself. Your speech needs to testify of him who justified you. And speak out your faith how he made you righteous. So the righteousness is a gift the gift of righteousness, the word of righteousness. As you have fellowship, continuous cleansing. I hope it makes sense. Okay. We'll, we'll get to James 1. Okay. Romans chapter 8. That's a very dangerous thing to say, Romans chapter 8. You can spend months here. Okay, Romans chapter 8 verse 10 says the following. But if Christ lives in you, okay, so how does he live in you? When you, you become born of the word. How does he live in you? When the word dwells in you, when the spirit dwells in you. Okay, so he says, if Christ lives in you, then although your natural body is dead by reason of sin and guilt, the Spirit is alive because of the righteousness that He imputes to you. So this word of righteousness that is a free gift that comes to you, He says, makes your spirit alive, if you believe it. Life comes to your spirit on the inside when you believe that you have been made righteous because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Okay. Righteousness that's being imputed to you. It's a free gift. Righteousness that's not earned. But it's given. As a gift. What do you do with a gift? You receive a gift. What, in what form is this gift? The word. <laughs> okay. So he says, although your natural body is dead by reason of sin and guilt, so your natural body is not yet manifested in uh, like a glorified state, okay? Your natural body dead by reason of sin and guilt, you know, because of Adam's mess. Now, on the inside, the spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he imputes to you. And if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead, so that's resurrection power, dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore to life your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Now this spirit, who is the gift, the righteousness, the life, the light, the word? Comes, you are born of the spirit, your spirit is made alive. Now, if he dwells. So that's the continuous fellowship. Yes, you are born again now. Your spirit is saved. But what about your soul? What about your body? Now that which has been deposited into your spirit, your unseen part, needs to start 
becoming seen in some way. So first, it will have an effect on how you think and how you speak. And people will look at you and see that you're different. It's not like you know, you've changed and you don't look like your passport photo anymore. You look the same. <laughs> you've been, you know, it's like those, what's it, the Naked Gun movie or whatever. It's like the woman says, okay, I'm going to go change. And then she's like in, in the place for like a second and she looks completely different. It's a totally different person coming <laughs> out of the thing. Okay. No. But people look at you and they see something else radiate. They see something else governs you. They see something else comes out of you when you speak. There's something about you that's totally different than before. Okay? So the Spirit of God has now touched you. You're born again. But now you take the Word and you meditate on it day and night. And that's what Romans chapter 12 calls the transformation by the renewal of the mind. Okay? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the entire renewal of your mind. So you meditate on the Word. So what comes to your conscience, what comes to your soul, what comes to your thinking, and what comes to your speaking, you know? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, life, light, righteousness starts coming to you, to your soul, as you meditate on the Word. And you start speaking different, you start doing different, you start looking different. So, there is a doing involved here. Grace doesn't mean you do nothing. It means you don't pay for your sin. Christ paid for your sin. But now there's a different thing governing you. Governing you. There's a different set of norms. There's a different word. There's a different identity, a different spirit that's available to you. Do you embrace that? So you need to embrace that. Like Hebrews chapter 4 says, strive to enter the rest. What is the rest? The rest is, is you ceasing from working and the, the word, the life, the light works in you through you. You are so one with him. As he speaks, you speak. As he shows you, you do and he does things through you. It's a complete rest. So, the gift of God is not only, okay, right, I got born again, check, and now I go on with my life like nothing happened. Grace doesn't mean, okay, oh, God will understand it's grace, and then I, you know. The grace means he empowers, he empowers you, he gives you something out of this world that comes only from him, that's from heaven, that's a gift. It's his very nature, his very identity, the very life source. He himself comes and dwells on the inside of you to express himself through you, and that's the gift. And we need to adapt to him and to make him welcome. You know, we don't, shouldn't just cut him off to one corner, you can, you can come out on Sundays at 9. And then at 11, terug in your boxy. Okay. So, you will come out in the time, you know, that you... God is not a genie. Okay, let me just try this scripture. We've looked at... 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. And yet I live. But it's not I that live. Christ lives. So the old man, Adam, that was active inside me, dead and buried with Christ. The exchange took place when I believed. All my sins came upon him. Everything that's detestable about my life, which is 
basically me in totality, came upon that cross. And he that is wonderful and glorious came into me. He is now on the inside of me. There's an exchange. So we need to get to the point where our thinking changes, where we stop justifying things before him and say, Lord, you know better. Come and live your life. Come forgive me for my best actions. Come and help me just live in me and through me. We have no idea what blessing he has for us. We still think we know better. <laughs> we still think what we want and how we want it is going to be better than the Spirit and what he says and what the Word says. If we can really just um, surrender to him, we will see his power and his glory on a level that we've never seen it before, okay? We can just completely surrender. That means you surrender the temptation to feel guilty. Stop it. You are forgiven. We surrender our past. It's paid. Somewhere you need to get that off of you. You've been Washed, you've been made righteous, you've been forgiven. Okay. James. Now a million things was going to pop up, but let's just read. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad among the Gentiles and the dispersion. Greetings. Consider it holy, joyful, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped and encounter trials of any sort and fall into various temptations. Like James, I thought you were going to give us some good stuff for now. <laughs> Be happy when, you know, when the poor boy eats the fan. He says, okay. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, when you are enveloped and encounter trials. If you read the first five verses of Romans chapter 5, you'll see the exact same thing. Where he speaks of the gift, we'll look at the gift a bit later, but he says this thing. Listen, in the midst of things not going right, you need to embrace the free gift of righteousness. In the midst of something tempting you, you need to Embrace the free gift of righteousness. And the result of that is life. Okay. So he says, uh, Be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your, of your faith brings out endurance, steadfastness, and patience. Exactly the same as in Romans chapter 5. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work that you may be people perfectly fully developed with no defects lacking in nothing. So if something bad in the world happens, it's a wonderful opportunity for you to prove what you believe. If you believe God heals the sick, you cannot express it and prove it unless you find someone who is sick. So if we say all things are possible, then kind of, you know, we'll, we'll really see if that's true when things go a bit off. So, some people say the gospel is a guarantee that everything in the world will be comfortable. No. The gospel is a guarantee that you have rulership over everything that's uncomfortable. So, if you have rulership, and we're talking about the gospel of the kingdom here, it means you will open your mouth and speak God's word, and that word will, have, will release the power to subdue whatever is not of God. And it's not going to always be immediate. Sometimes you just really need to keep on speaking something. Okay. So, for sickness, in, uh, for example. So, we need the fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5. Love. Well, we really need that. Okay. Joy. 
we really need that. <laughs> the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. So if we have the righteousness free gift, if we have joy and if we have peace, listen, all things are under your feet. That's the kingdom. That's God's authority. Love, joy, peace, patience. You know, people pray, Lord, give me patience. Give it now. Okay. Remember, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. So in the meantime, keep your eyes on Him in the midst of what's going wrong. Do not look at what's going, what is going wrong. Okay? I'm going to have to start wrapping it up. So I'll just mention something. Just, yes, Moses is standing in front of the Red Sea and the world's superpower is behind him trying to eradicate all his unarmed slaves that he's <laughs> taking out of the nation of Egypt. Okay, with all their gold. So Moses just says, as you see the Egyptians before you today, you will never see them again. He didn't look back. He didn't touch. He didn't look at them at all. He, say, he says, behold and see the salvation of the Lord today. God says, why do you cry unto me? You stretch out your hands. So you got to do something. So he was just obedient. He stretched out his hand. Okay? If you really look at the words, you know, with a staff across his shoulders like a cross, and he stretched out his hand like this, and the wind came and opened the sea. Okay. So King Jehoshaphat, there's, what's it, three or four armies against them. They're outnumbered. So God gives them instruction. It's, the, it's not your battle to fight. The battle is the Lord's. So they sent out the worship band first. Now imagine three armies, four armies against you, and you send out, they send out the Hilux Bucky with a worship band. <laughs> Singing praises to God. Give thanks to the Lord for His good and His mercy endures forever. And all the people started, they got confused, and they self-slaughtered until there was no one left. The last two of them, okay, on the count of three. Okay. Because they kept their eyes on him. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord. Everything has already been conquered in Christ. Your life is in Christ. You need to keep your eyes, your heart on him. Okay? Can we just get to the actual sermon? Okay. All right, so he says, so he's speaking of endurance. He says so that you can be a perfect man lacking nothing. Okay. Same as in Hebrews 10. If any of you is deficient in wisdom, so in this context, he's speaking of you need endurance, you need patience, and that's the wisdom. He says, if any one of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally, ungrudgingly, without reproaching or fault-finding, and it will be given him. So if you ask him for wisdom, he will give you a gift. Okay? So what is wisdom? Wisdom is words that you need. Okay, he will give you a gift. All right, only it must be in faith that he asks, with no wavering, no hesitation, no hesitating, no doubting, for the one who wavers is like the bellowing surge out at sea is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything from the Lord. Okay, that's a different picture than Mark chapter 11 that says, whatsoever you ask, you shall have. It's like, if you ask with, and you're doubting, God says, don't imagine you'll receive anything. So it's a kind of an all or nothing situation. Let's not just be imagining that we have faith. Let's, let's have faith. Meditate on the word, speak the word. Okay, then he says, verse 8, because as he is a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irresolute, 
He is unstable, unreliable, uncertain about everything he thinks and feels and decides. Okay, not something to associate with. Okay, so there's stability in your heart when you meditate on the word. Verse 9, let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his elevation as a Christian called to true riches and to be an heir of God. And the rich person ought to glory in being humbled by being shown his human frailty. Okay. Right. Verse 12, it says again, Blessed is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. All you need to do is, wanted to go to Ephesians 6 with the breastplate and the armor of God. He says, stand your ground. See, you just stand on a temptation. Stand your ground. And you say what God says, and you think what the, what the Word says, and you do what the Word says. So what you are doing in that situation, everything around you screams the opposite of the Word of God. But you just keep on thinking it, you just keep on speaking it, and you just keep on doing it. What will happen? Life will manifest out of you faster than you can imagine. And the worse it gets outside, the greater the life light is that is manifesting on the inside. The contrast is about to get greater in the next time. Because the world is losing its mind. You just keep on meditating on the Word, speaking the Word, and doing the Word. And you will see the light and the life shining out of you like, you, like, like you've never seen. He says, okay, where are we? Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted from God. For God is incapable of being tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But every person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed and baited by his own evil desire. So you can't even blame it on the devil. It's your own desire. <laughs> okay? So what happens? How do you kill the, if you read Colossians chapter 3, how do you kill the evil desire lurking in your members? You meditate on the word. Okay? You find your new real life hidden with Christ in God. Verse 15. Then the evil desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully matured, brings forth death. So if you go the evil desire route, you manifest death. But if you stick to the word out of which you are born, and you have fellowship with the life and light of the word, you are sons of light, then you manifest life. Okay. Okay. Do not be misled, my beloved brethren. Now, here's verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect, free, large, full gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of all that gives light, in the shining of whom there can be no variation, rising or setting, or shadow cast by his turning as in an eclipse. And it was of his own free will that he gave us birth as sons by his word of truth, so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, a sample of what he created to be consecrated to himself. Understand this, my beloved brethren. Let every man be quick to hear. So you hear the word. You hear the life and the light. You hear the word of righteousness. Okay? Slow to speak. Slow to take offense and to get angry. We usually only get angry if we don't operate by the word of God. We usually get angry if we take things personal and we want to give someone a piece of our mind. Okay? That's why the word says, when you are angry, do not sin. So when you are anger, angry, let it subside. Think the word, speak the word. Okay. Slow to speak. For man's anger does not promote the righteousness of God. Okay, so when man gets angry, no longer the gift, no longer God's gift in operation. So get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the 
power to save your souls. All right. How do I get rid of uncleanness? How do I get rid of the evil desire lurking in my members? Colossians 3 verse, what's that, 5. It says, In a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word, the gift. Okay? Which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls, your emotions, your thinking, your, all your ideas, what's dwelling on the inside of you. Verse 22, but be doers of the word. Obey the message, not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. There's a lot of grace preaching that causes people to reason contrary to the truth and to go rather the uh, route of trying to justify what they're busy with than to receive the grace and get out of what they're busy with. Okay. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it and being a doer of it, he's like a man who looks carefully at his own natural face in a mirror. So it's better to look, when you look in the mirror of the word, it's better to look for his face in the mirror. Okay. Thoughtfully observes himself, then goes off and promptly forget what he was like. Okay. There's a lot of extra in there. Listen. Our anger doesn't promote God's righteousness. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Do the word. And he says, don't be deceived. The, every good gift, perfect, free, large, full gift is from above. Okay, so first thing that comes to mind when I read that is, is also, if, if something is evil, it can't be from God. <laughs> God did not give you the sickness. God did not give you the bad situation to try and teach you. God did not put you in a trial. He tests no, ten, tempts no one. He is incapable of being tempted. But He's right there to help you out of it. He's right there to give you the answer. He's right there with His arms stretched out to bring salvation. We have a gift that is not far away. You don't have to say who will bring it. Who will, if you read Deuteronomy, who will go overseas to get it for us? But what does it say? It's near you in your heart and on your lips. So, fellowship with the word, the person. When you read it, let it come from recorded scripture form into reality. Let him dwell in you. Let him come alive in you. Let him live in you through you. Let him energize you. Let him animate you. Let him move you. Let it be him speaking in you. Let it be him thinking in you. Let it be him acting through you. The result is the victor's crown of life. All right.